Hello, everyone, and welcome to Baker Boyer's semi annual business panel. I'm Mario Delgadillo, Regional Business Banking Manager. This is our first panel of 2022, and today we have an excellent group of speakers for you. Uh, we're thankful to be joined by Russ Roberts, owner of Russ Roberts in Yakima. Uh, we also have the pleasure of being joined today by Dr. Patrick Jones, PhD, Executive Director of the Institute of Public Policy and Economic Analysis. But before we begin our panel, our very own business advisor, Ashley Mahan, will share the results from our latest business climate survey. Uh, thank you to everyone who had the opportunity to participate in the survey. And for those that didn't have a chance this time around, uh, we'd love to hear from you. We believe you'll find the results insightful and helpful with your future business planning efforts. Uh, once again, thank you so much, and I'll turn it over to Ashley Mahan to begin. Hello, and welcome to the second annual Business Climate Survey presentation. My name is Ashley Mahan, and I'm a business advisor here on our commercial lending team in Walla Walla. Today, I'm going to share the results of our 2022 Business Climate Survey. The intention of this video is to provide you with a brief presentation of the survey results, including commentary provided by survey respondents. Our goal is to conduct these surveys annually to get a sense for how our commu business communities are navigating the current business climate and how they are positioning themselves for the future. As we go through the slides today, please keep in mind that this is our second survey and we've made some tweaks to the survey from last year, so we're not quite ready to provide comparative data or trend analysis, but we had a decent participation rate and I'm excited to share some high level results. With that said, let's dive in. First, let's get an understanding of the makeup of survey responders. Then we'll review each survey question along with the responses and we'll conclude with high level results. I have three slides for you to get an understanding of who took the survey. So please keep this information in the back of your mind as you think about the survey results. Here, we can see that we had good representation of participants through all four of Baker Boyer's markets with Walla Walla and Yakima uh, making up the most of the audience. Yes, these percentages add up to more than 100 because some of the businesses check that they operate in more than one location. FTE counts within these businesses show that 65% of respondents have 20 or fewer full-time equivalent employees. As with last year's survey participants, the majority of the businesses responding are mature in age. Um, I was happy to see that we've had a broad range of gross annual rev revenue figures represented as well. Lastly, here we can see that there is good diversity across industries. Within the other category, there were a couple of wineries, a brewery, a government entity, and a real estate servicing business. So to recap as a whole, survey participants are mostly from Walla Walla and Yakima. They're small with 20 or fewer full-time equivalent employees, but established having been in business for over 10 years, and they're diverse in terms of average annual gross revenue and industries. So now that we have an idea for who answered the survey, let's go through each of the 12 questions. First question is asking about expectations in 2022. As we can see here, this year's expectations are that gross revenues will increase, profit margins will remain the same or decline, and we can expect to see some businesses invest in capital projects while employee turnover is expected to maintain the course. Employee turnover is expected to be consistent with last year. There were a couple comments surrounding the use of technology to solve some employment needs, such as hiring contractors and virtual assistants, and also turning to robotics to reduce reliance on the workforce. For those expecting a rise in gross revenues, we collected comments about businesses forecasting increased sales volume and businesses and in industries who have benefited from increased demand during the pandemic and expect it to continue into 2022. Many of uh, those who are expecting a decline in profit margins cited increasing costs of payroll. The trend from all the comments showed that higher costs of goods sold and wages are creating a need to increase prices, which is in turn expected to help increase gross revenue, which is resulting in the consistent profit margins expectation. Question two att um, attempts to further understand those capital spending projects anticipated this year. 23% of respondents are not planning on increasing capital spending. 
but from those who are, the majority of them will be purchasing equipment. Companies within the restaurants, bars, or alcohol production industries commonly reported multiple areas for capital investments within equipment, facility improvement or expansion, and furnitures and fixtures. Over half of the survey respondents agree that most the most important factors to their profit outlook in the next year are cost of goods, sales, the economy, um, and employee pay and benefits. Next question four looks at the drivers of revenue during 2021. 76% of companies reported that the pandemic affected their revenue last year. 44% of those said COVID has been the cause for lack of revenue growth, while 32% said that COVID has contributed to revenue growth. Those citing COVID as a contributor to revenue growth were primarily within the construction, finance, or insurance industries, and then also within retail and restaurant or alcohol industries cited COVID as a driver of revenue growth, which I'm guessing could be correlated um, with a strong tourism last year. For question five, when asked to rank these items in order of greatest impact on improving productivity and efficiency going forward, 26% of these participants agreed that the supply chain is the number one most important. But as you can see here, that there wasn't a significant consensus among the survey respondents. So I looked to see if there's alignment within industries, but the rankings were quite varied. So I think a good takeaway here is to remember that your business is unique. Maybe your competitor is focused on innovating while your biggest priority is reorganizing management to ensure the company is set up for the future. Question six, when asked about profitability in 2021, we see that most said it grew. Of the 66% of survey respondents reporting profit profitability growth last year, Keep in mind that 91% of them have also been in business for over 10 years. And from question four earlier, we know that the reasons were mostly attributed to increased demand. Within these responses, delays in the supply chain and cost of goods were cited among the most common reasons for a flat or declining profit margin last year. When comparing 2021 results with 2021 expectations, 23% of the participant in last year's business climate said that they expected profit margins to increase. Bearing in mind that the survey participants are not the exact same people year over year, um, generally speaking, expectations did not match reality. Profitability grew last year when most thought otherwise. Question seven intended to dig deeper into business plans for 2022. Clearly, businesses are expected to make changes to their prices. Comments from participants overwhelmingly noted their price increases will mirror the increases in their raw materials and employee compensation, which matches national trends. Comments about changes in business strategies and business investments noted expansion of facilities or services or changing product offerings. Some people mentioned investing and implementing technologies to increase sales or improve efficiency. And as noted within the commentary mentioned on the last slide, here on question eight, we can see which boxes were checked for the most common drivers of price changes, which you're probably not too surprised by. So next, coming off of a few slides about increased ex expenses and expectations of price increases, it's great to see here that businesses are feeling pretty optimistic about 2022, with five being highly optimistic here. And with the next slide, we'll see they expect revenues to maintain the course or grow. So here, look, optimism is alive and well. Capacity and momentum were some of the main commentary themes here. Some quotes included phrases such as, our capacity will be much greater, more inventory for more sales, we're securing additional volume, and this is my third year in business and we're gaining momentum, and also we have plenty of work lined up, but I'm worried that we could have some kind of slowdown. So a little caution there with the optimism. All right, second to last question. Question 11 asks about pressures businesses are facing within non-wage compensation, economic policies impacting their decisions, compensation pressure for new hires, for skilled workers, and lastly, wage compensation pressure overall. 
Dark blue represents yes to the pressure, showing pressure in most of these categories, with the largest agreement being compensation pressure for skilled workers. To give some examples from the survey comments, one participant said, keeping our skilled workers paid relative to new hires has been a struggle. Another pointed out that a shrinking labor pool and inflation are forcing higher pay. And now we're at the last question from the survey. The second and last bars on this slide relate to price trends and hiring activity, which we've covered in pretty good detail already. Comments associated with these questions are consistent with earlier remarks. Yes, price increases are planned to match the increased cost of materials, payroll, etc. Now the first bar on here says, are terms and availability of credit influencing capital spending plans for your business or the businesses you are familiar with? Um, overwhelming response is no, meaning that business financing is not causing issues for capital spending plans. Some say financing has been reasonable to obtain. Others say that their cash flow from their operations has been sufficient to cover capital spending projects. On the other hand, shown in the third bar, when asked if there are any recent changes that might affect capital spending activity, many participants noted um, issues within the supply chain and inability to find equipment. So while survey respondents noted earlier that they plan for equipment purchases in 2022, many of which are also reporting that they're having a hard time accessing these desired purchases. So if that sounds like you, know that you're not alone. And to wrap this up, here are some quick key observations. So employees, many are having difficulty finding skilled workers and those workers are demanding higher pay. Overall compensation um, increases are taking place this year if they haven't already. And I think it's interesting to note that a few of the survey participants shared that they will, will be looking to technology to reduce the reliance on the shrinking and more expensive labor pool. Next, inflationary pressures, demand, rising costs of goods sold, and increased compensation are putting upward pressure on businesses to increase prices in order to maintain profit margins. And lastly, optimism and growth are very much expected in 2022. 89% of survey participants expect sales or revenues to remain stable or accelerate compared to 2021. And 83% are planning for capital investments to continue at the current pace or to increase them. Equipment will be the primary category of asset investment if the supply chain can support the demand. This concludes our business climate survey presentation. We will distribute these slides to everyone who provided their information when completing the survey and we'll have it available on our website soon. I want to extend a big thank you for those of you who participated in the survey Please look for this survey in the future and we can continue to learn from each other. Thank you. Good morning, Baker Boyer Nation. Russ Roberts coming to you, not live, but via our Zoom, so it's the next best thing. Uh, I'm here to talk about one of my favorite things, commercial real estate. I hope after you uh, hear my presentation, you love it too. Uh, again, Russ Roberts. I'm with Keller Williams Commercial Real Estate here in Yakima. And a little bit of background about me. I've uh, been in real estate since uh, 1988, which I got my real estate license when I'm 18. So you can kind of do the math and figure that out if you want to. And that came about, um, I was slated to be a fourth generation plumber. Not going to happen. I said, what does mom do? She was in real estate and banking. I said, that's it. I'm going to do that. Let's try that. So uh, it's just got my license just because I uh, went to San Diego State University. All you Aztecs out there, got to love you. I uh, got a degree in 1993 with a degree in financial planning and a minor in real estate. And from there, worked for an escrow company for a year and for a title company and top producer in San Diego and learn a lot in the backgrounds of what happens in actual real estate. And if you really want to know that stuff, you can talk to me later about it. We'll uh, get into that. Uh, but I did work as a financial planner from 03, uh, actually not 03, 1993 to 2005. And then in 2006, uh, moved to Yakima a little before that and kind of uh, got into commercial real estate. And I was blown away, mostly from the fact that 
being a financial planner, I loved analysis. I loved doing calculations. I liked things like that and doing real estate on the side. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my goodness, you can do real estate that has to do with numbers and financial. Blown away. Love it. I love what I do. Commercial real estate is amazing. So let's get a little bit more into that about what it means and what it looks like. Um, the only other thing I like to share that I think is a pretty significant was in 2011, I received my CCIM designation. Uh, CCIM stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. It's pretty similar to like a master's degree in commercial real estate and less than 2% of all real estate agents hold this designation. So it's a really big deal. It's, it's bean counting, number crunching, but you know, if I need to run with an attorney or a CPA, hey, how'd you get that number? How'd you calculate that return? I am more than qualified, very competent, and very excited to do that. I, I love doing that sort of thing. So what is a commercial real estate broker? This is really easy to break down. It's basically everything but a house. Don't do that. There's 500 other real estate agents you can talk to just in Yakima about houses. I do commercial real estate. So what exactly does that mean? It could be a retail strip center where you go get your nails done or a super cuts. It could be a vineyard, a, an orchard, a winery. Uh, it could be a big industrial property. Lots of different things are, are kind of what I sell. Um, it could be vacant lots. It could be light industrial zone vacant lots. It could be an office building. It could be this Baker Boyer Bank. It could be here. That's where I am, by the way. Um, it could be a mixed use property and you'll see on the video I've got a lot of different types of properties that I've got into whether it's a mixed use uh, a restaurant I got a little restaurant that I'm working on selling right now um, multifamily we're gonna talk about that in a few minutes multifamily is fancy word for apartments uh, pretty crazy out there what's going on in multifamily nice office buildings just down the street ended up selling this one on a 40th Avenue and Yakima Avenue great property great return uh, just closed a really big deal of uh, 25 acres and 275,000 square foot industrial building that had, you know, ambient storage, cold storage, CA or controlled atmosphere storage, pretty much had everything. Uh, great, great building and a great local buyer ended up buying that. So a couple of questions I kind of want to go over that people get asked me about it is, you know, what has changed in the market because of COVID? and or has it changed and in this market so far uh it's only really affected the multifamily market or the apartment in the sense that um governors put on that restriction out there on uh, eviction so it has affected that and i get a lot of questions about well if everybody's working from home now what's going on with office space are you seeing a big hit in office space and the reality is no and i think it's probably more appropriately not yet there are more people working from home. There is less demand for office space. You're seeing lots of places uh, shrinking down, becoming a little bit smaller in office space. I would imagine in 2022, 23, we're gonna start to see that trending away from office, but that's really all that's affected by COVID. Uh, secondly, um, we touched on it. How has a recent eviction moratorium affected real estate? Um, and my answer to that is fortunately in commercial real estate, the way leases are written, you can't evict people out of an office building or an industrial building or um, a retail building. You can evict them, but they don't have that moratorium that they have on multifamily or apartments. So it hasn't really affected that much. And primarily that's because the way that commercial leases are written and a good commercial attorney or real estate attorney can help you out with that. So another question I get a lot of times is, what is a cap rate and how do I calculate it and why does it matter? That is a great question. Uh, cap rate stands for a capitalization rate. And in the simplest term, it's a snapshot in time of a return on your money. So for example, let's just say you're buying a property and after all the expenses and everything comes out, you net $10,000 on a $100,000 investment. If you divide those two, it's a 10% cap rate. There's nothing that's a 10% cap rate right now that's maybe like in the hood in Alabama or something. It's ridiculous the rate of return that commercial properties are getting right now, much, much lower. Um, but the thing to remember mostly about cap rates is it's very, how do we put it, investor specific. Investors have a minimum return that they're looking for. So say for example, you want a 7% return on your money. 
you versus somebody that wants a 10% return on their money, you're gonna be willing to pay more for that property than the other person would. And that's where the capitalization rate comes into play. Um, there's lots of different calculations as a CCIM that I do for my clients. Uh, we can run a cash on cash return. We can run a discounted cash flow analysis. We can run in, an internal rate of return. And I don't have time to get into those, but if you want to, you can email me or call me. I'd be happy to go over those things with you sometime in the future. Um, another question, speaking specifically to my market, what's going on in the Yakima real estate market? Well, the reality is in a lot of markets, but I'm going to keep it in Yakima, got two, two hot markets right now. Multifamily apartments, we already discussed that, and industrial warehouses. So let's dive into that for a second. So multifamily apartments is hot. It's stupid hot. It, I can't believe the prices people are paying for apartments right now. We have Seattle investors and, I hate to say it, California investors coming up here and gobbling stuff up because to them, it, it's pretty cheap. So for example, you know, Seattle buyers and California buyers, they're paying crazy prices of five and 6% cap rate on apartments. And five years ago, it was probably seven to eight. Uh, if you own any apartments out there, I would be selling them right now. I believe we're at the top of the bell curve with the current administration. I don't know what's going on there. Long-term capital gains are probably the lowest we're gonna see maybe ever again. It's just a crazy time right now in apartments. To kind of give you a ballpark, they're going about $100,000 a door. And again, five, six years ago, we were probably half that, maybe 50,000 a door, $60,000 a door. So there's, a, there's somewhere between a 30 and 50% increase in multifamily in just the last five to six years. Absolutely crazy. The other one, number two, industrial properties are also really hot. And primarily because the cost to build is atrocious right now. And it's been for two or three years. No one is building industrial. Um, the exceptions would be the, the big fruit guys are, but they're owner users. They need it for themselves. That's fine. But there is a huge demand for the 10 to 30,000 square foot warehouses out there and no one is no one has them either they're hoarding them they're holding on to them they're an owner user they need them but when a when industrial property hits the market it it is gone almost immediately at asking price or above i have not seen that the 16 years i've been doing commercial real estate here you hear about it in the residential going at or above market but not not in this case, industrial property is starting to do that. Uh, not only the, the building specifically, but also the, the uh, land is also going, starting to go at a premium. Uh, another question, how do I assess purchasing commercial property in the current environment with low rates, but the market at high values? Ooh, loaded question. That's a great question. <laughs> uh, low rates are pushing values you know, higher and higher, people can afford to buy more. You know, six, seven, eight years ago, loans were 7% on commercial property. I'm seeing them right now at three and a half to 4%, which is just almost unbelievable that you can get a rate that low on commercial property. Uh, so they're using leverage to buy more and in places where they're appreciating, they're coming out smelling like a rose doing that. Uh, the other thing I would do is I would definitely get yourself in front of a commercial broker, a full-time commercial broker that knows what they're doing, and ideally a CCIM like myself that can run all those different kind of analysis that we talked about earlier. And uh, kind of as a final note and to my uh, presentation is just like in residential real estate, I know it's a cliche, but it's totally true. The best thing to do in real estate is location, location, location. Not kidding. It's, that's what you need to do. Uh, hopefully, if you have any other questions, you can uh, track me down on the presentation. There'll be my phone number, 509-594-7989, and my email, which is roberts like my last name, R-O-B-E-R-T-S, at ccim.net. That's roberts at ccim.net. I appreciate talking with you guys, and hopefully I look forward to uh, hearing from you. Thank you. Hello, everyone. This is Patrick Jones from Eastern Washington University's Public Policy and Economics Institute. I'm here today with Baker Bar Bank to give you some insights from the latest data we've posted to Yakima Valley Trends, a website that's been in your community for about four or five years. 
and we will be looking at some key indicators that drive overall activity in your local economy. Well, we will start our look at the Yakima economy by looking at population, because population definitely drives a lot of the factors that we measure as economists. And so we're going to look at total population and its annual growth rate. This, if you're not familiar with Yakima Valley Trends, is the very first indicator we track. And you can see by hovering over that the uh, population in 2021 in Yakima County was estimated as a, as a tad over 258,000, which represented just a small increase from 200 and almost 257,000 the prior year. Uh, over the past decade, the growth in the county has been what I'm going to call modest. Uh, the number of folks who are basically new in 2021 that weren't there in 2012, numbers about 12,000 people. And as a growth rate, which is tracked by this red line, uh, it's a very modest growth rate of half of a percent per year. And compared to the state of Washington in green, that's about a third of the annualized growth rate uh, that we've observed over the past decade. And it's a little less than the growth rate of the U.S. population. And I'm not going to take the time to present what's behind this, but I can tell you if you poke around on Yakima Valley Trends and look at net migration, you will find that uh, the migration levels in um, Yakima County for almost the last two decades have been negative. In other words, more people leaving than coming in. And the only way that population has grown is that there's been a surplus of births over deaths. So modest growth in the county. Now let's look at wages because wages are the primary determinant of income. And we wanna trace, track down what income then leads to. So we're gonna consider wages, then we'll consider income. So this is looking at the average wage in Yakima County in 2020, it was, as you can read here, perhaps uh, $44,000 plus. That re represented a 7% increase from the prior year, which is quite good. It's far greater, far better than the trend line when you calculate an annual rate of increase uh, over the last decade that trend would yield about 3.5 percent. So in 2020, wages grew twice as fast as they had over the prior decade. Uh, so far this year, we're looking at a very modest increase uh, for, for the periods that we have data for. And when I say this year, it's actually 2021. I'm talking to you obviously from 2022, but we only have data from the first half of 2021. My sense is, uh, due to a couple of different reasons, is that the wage uh, growth between 2020 and 2021 is going to end up between the trend, which was 3.5%, and uh, 2020's experience, which was 7%, so let's call that 4 to 4.5%. 4 and my uh, guess that uh, for 2022, the year that we're just starting, is that we will revert a little closer to trend. Uh, so my sense is we will be looking at 3.5 to 4%. I think it'll be a little higher just because employment rates have come down and, and, and due to the general uh, relative scarcity in the labor force. So we care about the wages because wages drive income personal income. And this is the look at personal income on a per capita basis uh, over the last 50 years in Yakima County, obviously an upward rise. Uh, th this is not deflated for inflation, however, but I hope you can make out that in, in between these last two data points on the red line, which is Yakima, that is quite a steep pitch 
to the curve. And among the different metro areas that uh, we track at Eastern Washington Universities for personal income, which is all of the large areas in Eastern Washington, Eastern Washington, this is by far and away the largest bump of any. Uh, uh, the community went from about 44,000 in 2019 to 49,000. So that is a, a, a gain of about $5,000 in one year. And um, wages, as you saw, uh, went up considerably by 7%, but also really contributing to this uh, unprecedented increase in uh, personal income in the county w was, were the payments from Washington, D.C. We call these federal transfer payments. They uh, capture Social Security, Medicaid, M Medicare, veterans payments, and importantly, uh, for last year, unemployment benefits. So if you look at the unemployment benefits, they went up uh, hugely uh, between 2019 and 2020. And so, so did transfer payments as a share of overall income. They went up from a three-year average, the prior years of 25%, uh, they went up to 29%. And in an economy as big as uh, Yakima's is, uh, over six billion, that means some real money. So, uh, what do I think that 2021 will be like? Well, it'll be much like my forecast for 20 uh, for for wages, and that is, I think we'll have a, a, a reverse reversion to trend that might be uh, uh, higher than 4.2 percent, which is the trend over the last 10 years, because of the continued uh, amount of transfer payments that flowed into the community up through September. So my guess is that 2021 is going to, when the records are all done, is going to show a growth of about four and a half to five and a half percent. And then 2022 should be much closer to trend. And uh, that trend again is about 4%. Uh, the state of Washington forecast that we get from Olympia's uh, uh, forecasters is actually much lower at uh, about 2%, but I think uh, Yakima should do just because of the success of your, of, of in particular agriculture, you should be looking at something larger than that. So that's the average for personal income. Now let's look at the, 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 the quantity number, which is the number of people employed. So let's turn to an indicator that tracks the number of people employed. And uh, no surprise, you can see that in 2019, there was a pretty substantial drop between 2019 and 2020. That's a drop of over 5,000 workers. Uh, what do we know about 2021? Uh, we have some preliminary data in on a monthly basis that will be rolled up to an annual number sometime this year. And we can tell you that as of November, that the uh, employment levels in the county exceeded the employment of 2019. It took a while for the county to reach uh, that level of surpassing 2019, which is what we consider the pre-pandemic baseline, but it did happen in late fall, and um, it happened by a lot of workers. There, as of 20, as of November of 2021, there were 9,000 more people employed in the county than there were in November of 2019. Quite an increase. Looking forward, I think this will continue uh, uh, in uh, 2022, not at the rate we've seen, however, in 2021, simply because we're running up against some constraints uh, in the workforce. Uh, we're seeing this nationally um, due to a variety of reasons. And also because I think the first quarter data are going to be heavily impacted 
by uh, Omicron and the um, the really really short supply that we've observed in the workforce uh, due to some fears of folks uh, joining the workforce in customer facing industries. So let me wrap up then with uh, a measure that most everybody at the local level is concerned about uh, because it does describe economic activity to such a large degree in our state and certainly for those uh, public sector um, leaders, school uh, school districts, and uh, and and definitely uh, municipal governments is retail sales. It translates into um, retail sales, of course, are based on a variety of sectors, uh, not the least of which is the housing market. So um, let's look at the annual rate. And uh, annually, uh, we reached uh, 4.5, 4, let's, yeah, 4.4, between 4.4 and 4.5 billion of retail sales in 2020. That was a nice increase from the prior year. So even during the pandemic, people were spending money to the point where uh, the cash registers were busier than they were in the prior year, despite despite the shutdown that we saw in the second quarter and in parts of the third and fourth quarters. Uh, this wasn't a huge increase, however. Uh, you can see here that the increase was just about a, a tad over 0%, but it was still greater than what we observed statewide, which was a negative 1.5%. And how has Yakima done, uh, or how did Yakima do since then? Well, we have two quarters worth of data. The first is uh, for Q1 of 2021, and that came in about 15% higher than 2020. And then second quarter came in at 25% higher than the second quarter of 2020, which of course was the quarter that really took the the brunt of the, of the shutdown um, uh, due to the pandemic. We won't know the data for a couple more weeks on quarter three uh, and, and then considerably later on quarter four. So we won't know really how 2021 ends uh, until mid-year, but it's my sense looking at the uh, monthly data we get from the state and observing a certain correlation between Yakima's economy and the state economy that uh, these retail sales increases will still be fairly strong. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go out on a, on a limb here and say they're going to be low uh, double digits uh, in the third quarter and high single digits in the fourth quarter. So that by the end of the year, it's going to be quite strong uh, for 2021 versus 2020. Now we're in 2022. So we all care about what's going to happen this year. And I'm just uh, going to uh, offer the, the caution that I've observed in the forecast from uh, the state forecasters as they're trying to estimate state revenues, they're looking at a very modest increase for 2022, and that makes perfectly uh, good sense to me. So I wouldn't count on anything more than uh, mid-single digits in terms, uh, in terms of growth in Yakima County retail sales between uh, 2021 and 20. 22. So there you have it, uh, a very brief look back and an a even briefer look forward. And I hope this has been of some value to your plans for this year. <music>